Tonight, we look at the story that has been told about the murder of John Benet Ramsey and why so many think her parents guilty and what this tells us about the America she so briefly lived in. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Episode 24 deals with the first press conference that the Ramses gave. I think it was May 2nd, 1997, shortly after they'd both given their first police interviews at the end of April. I think it was over three days at the end of April. The next episode in the series will go back to the timeline. FBI profiler John Douglas profiles the Ramses. We'll go through that narrative. And then episode 26 deals with Dr. Suzanne Bernard's interview with Burke Ramsey on January 8th. So around about two weeks after the incident. This is really vital input into the case from a specialist in child psychology. In this episode, we're going to deal with the first press conference the Ramses gave after that CNN interview. So we're jumping a little bit forward in time. And I will follow that with an answer to the question I posed to you guys in the previous episode, dealing with how you can kind of solve, that's quote unquote, solve the Ramsey case not within uh, a months or weeks or even days, but within a few minutes of the whole case really even starting. And it's something that is both obvious and not obvious at the same time. Once again, thank you to the 100 or so folks who've subscribed in the last day or so. The channel is now 27,000 subscribers. So welcome to everyone who's new here. Also welcome to those who've made the transition to Patreon. Patreon's a lot like the Crime Rocket blog used to be daily updates on a variety of issues but it's just kind of a lot more polished and there are also other things there like audio books and analysis and also a little bit of personal insights into you know behind the scenes what's going on you know in terms of writing certain books and in terms of a couple of peeks into the life of a creator on patreon Bear in mind, you can also join Patreon at a discount for a year. I think you get something like 5% off if you join for a yearly subscription. Once again, if you want to join Patreon, head on to the description. But the web address is www.patreon.com slash TCRS. Okay, and let's get started. So we are now going to look at the interview that John and Patsy gave on I think it was the 2nd of May but it was definitely very early in May and it was immediately after the police interviews and what I want you to sort of pay attention to is first of all in this case it's once again John sitting on the left Patsy sitting on the right and how John and Patsy sort of appear compared to their previous appearance on CNN on January 1st, four months earlier. So I'm sure most of you would agree that in this interview, Patsy doesn't look drugged or medicated or traumatized or sort of as overcome with grief as she did in the previous interview. Also, John looks a lot more centered and sure of himself. So that is just one obvious difference. But we're going to now go into the actual interview and then just make a couple of observations. You guys are more than welcome to join in in the analysis of the 12 minute clip. I'll put a link to the clip in the description and then you guys can watch the whole thing there yourself. OK, so let's listen in. To those of you who may want to ask, let me address very directly. I did not kill my daughter, John Bonet. Uh, there have also been innuendos that she has has been or was sexually molested. I can tell you those were the most hurtful uh, innuendos uh, to us as a family. Uh, they are totally false. Uh, John, Bonet, John Bonet and I had a very close uh, relationship. Uh, I will miss her dearly for the rest of my life. 
So that is John's sort of opening statement. It was probably something that he'd prepared. It's something that he fluffed. At one point he says John Banai. And I think that is a sign of nerves. The first thing that he tries to counter is the allegation that he had something to do with, well, first of John, first of all, with John Bonet's death, but also having some kind of, um, you know, by inference, some kind of involvement in the abuse that was supposedly present, right? And um, so I think John is correct here. First of all, he didn't kill John Bonet, and second of all, he wasn't abusing her. But there's something he's not correct about, and it's this. Uh, there have also been innuendos that she has, has been or was sexually molested. I can tell you those were the most hurtful uh, innuendos uh, to us as a family. There have also been innuendos that she has, has been or was sexually molested. I can tell you those. So what is quite interesting with his statement here is that he's sort of conflating the talk about sexual abuse with that there are innuendos, I guess, that he's involved, although he doesn't directly address that. He doesn't say the innuendos implicate me. What he does is he simultaneously is horrified about them and about it being related to him indirectly and dismisses them. So what is not really accurate there is that I don't think you could say that the idea, the concept, the issue of some kind of sexual element to what happened to John Bonet, I don't think you could say that that is innuendo. I don't think you can say that is fictional. And what is interesting in the Ramsey saga is in the same way that the ransom note is initially kind of dismissed by the Ramses themselves at the crime scene in terms of them not reading it, in terms of them not handling it, in terms of them not caring when the 10 o'clock deadline comes and goes. So in the same way that the ransom note is dismissed and even in the CNN interview, they don't really talk about it. They don't try and sort of say, hey, this is in the ransom note. We need to be looking for this kind of person. And then, so in other words, the ransom note is initially dismissed and then later on, it's the flavor of the month. Let's just talk about the ransom note. We're looking for this kind of person. And that's kind of, that's something that appears in their book as well. And, you know, so they exclude Pat as the ransom note writer. And now they want to know who wrote the ransom note kind of thing. So I'm just saying the ransom note starts off as totally unimportant, totally irrelevant. And then it becomes the most relevant thing. And let's talk about that. You actually have the same thing with the sexual narrative. It starts off with totally... Um, it's a totally uh, insulting to them. It's totally irrelevant. It is not true. And then later on, it becomes the actual fulcrum of the case that they are looking for a pedophile, essentially. They're looking for some kind of um, dirty old man, some kind of intruder who was targeting John Bonet, perhaps because of her activity in pageants. Now, while that is fanciful and fictional, it certainly is plausible if you didn't know the case very well. What I'm trying to get at is just that the narrative changes from the whole sexual thing is totally bogus as far as they're concerned. And then later on, no, 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 no. That is exactly who we are looking for. Someone, some kind of sexual predator. But now you've kind of got to ask the question, and it's a question you can also address in the Amanda Knox cases, if there was the sexual attack, why did the attacker forget to actually have a sexual attack, right? Because there is no evidence of uh, bodily fluids of a other person in the sexual attack, right? And it doesn't really appear that there really was a sexual attack in the sense that John Bonet was sort of fully clothed. In fact, she wasn't only fully clothed, whatever she was wearing, something else was put on, right? So that's something just to address. I'll be coming back to emphasize this, but I think it is worth emphasizing here that if the intruder was a stranger, then it would be totally unnecessary for the stranger to kind of tuck John Bonet in a blanket once he was done with her. Sort of, I literally mean sort of tuck the blanket underneath her. 
And once again, you have a parallel to the Amanda Knox case where the victim was found under a comforter, not quite tucked in the same way, in kind of a careful way, with the blanket sort of wrapped around her. In in Amanda Knox's case, the victim, Meredith Kircher, was simply lying under a blanket, almost like you'd get in a situation where you found a body lying in the road. So someone would then cover it with something, a sheet or something like that. But it's not the kind of thing a stranger, especially a stranger with malicious intent, would do to someone else who's basically a stranger to them. And in that regard, I'm sorry I'm straying a little bit, but in that regard, I just want to play a clip from an actual interrogation with John Ramsey, where he's asked about this blanket, and he kind of cuts himself off from saying that she was tucked in, because it's odd. There was a white blanket. Uh, and I just knew it. And the blanket was brought up around her. And you know, crossed in front of her as if somebody was... Okay, so now let's go to Patsy's statement in early May 1997. I'm Patsy Ramsey, JonBenet's mother, and I'm grateful that we are finally able to meet together face to face. I'm appalled that anyone would think that John or I would be involved in such a hideous, heinous crime. But let me assure you that I did not kill Jean Benet. I did not have anything to do with it. I love that child with my whole of my heart and soul. Mr. Mitch so we're going to look at what Patsy said and go back to what John said through kind of different layers and we're also going to look at the broader picture in other words you can kind of turn the sound down and look at these two people sitting on a couch surrounded by the media and just think in a much broader way what are we dealing with here right so let's just start with um, Patsy she she's um, definitely a little bit better at this than John is meaning she introduces herself she speaks kind of quite emphatically she doesn't fluff her lines if i can put it that way she's obviously much much better in this interview than she was on cnn she's uh, quite eloquent she uh, makes eye contact in a way she kind of looks like she's there and that she's got a game face on and in a way she's more um convincing but not only that she's more she's more effusive than her husband so what i want you to pay attention to now is the things that are, are said by both john and patsy that i think are clearly inaccurate see if you agree so let's start with patsy and i'm grateful that we are finally able to meet together face to face. So if um, Patsy was the ransom note writer, and we, we don't know whether she was, but if she was, do you think that she would want to be talking to the media? Also, do you think, given what happened the last time she spoke to the media and her husband, this was on CNN, it kind of led to the media kind of jumping into the Ramsey case, seizing all the information and the videos and the photos that they could, and basically turning the Ramsey case into this massive media spectacle. And do you think they would have wanted to be under the spotlight? First of all, John, he wants, to, he wants his business to flourish. He wants to kind of go back to business. You think he would want to be the case to be the sort of under the spotlight, and the other side is uh, Patsy. Do you think she would want to be under the spotlight in terms of the criticism of being a pageant mom and the fact of you know sh you had this unusual situation that her daughter 
was sort of being groomed at a very early age to be Miss America. Do you want to now be back in the spotlight dealing, sort of bringing all this up again and leading to another storm? Would you want that? Now, you might say, why not? If they were innocent, surely they would want the public's attention so they could catch the intruder, right? But the flip side to that argument is that they haven't been in the media for four months. And the other thing that I said, I'm not sure if it was in the Patreon segment or the YouTube segment, but I was reading from, from Pat Corton's statement and their strategy with the media was to keep a low profile. And so the fact that they kept to that strategy meant, you know, when you don't keep a low profile like this, having a press conference, what, it, what is it all for? In other words, if you say, let's keep a low profile, and then you come out of, not hiding, but you come out of that sort of umbrella of silence, what's that all about? And isn't the answer to control the narrative? Isn't this press conference to control the narrative? And then you say, well, what narrative? They've just given their statements to the police. And so the ball is kind of in the police's court, and the media would want to go to the police and say, what did the Ramses say? Can you, can you tell us something? Can you leak something? Just give us something. And instead of that, the Ramses now come on to uh, you know, the, the, the news cycle once again. And they basically clear their names. But it's kind of a situation of the suspects clearing their own names. Just as Chris Watts tried to do during the Sermon on the Porch, right? Just as Chris Watts tried to do during the polygraph test. I'm saying the motive for this kind of thing is to clear your name. You might be innocent, you might be guilty, but that is the point of it. So when Patsy says, you know, I was really looking forward to this, I don't know if she was. And what did John say that is likely inaccurate in that short opening statement? Let's listen in again. Uh, John Bonet and I had a very close uh, relationship. Uh, I will miss her dearly for the rest of my life. So this might be a little bit nitpicky to say this. John may have felt he did have a close relationship with his daughter, that they were a loving father and daughter, and that the daughter also loved her father. But just to be a little bit kind of global about it in a way, just to be a bit more realistic about it, we know that what she said to the gardener, Brian Scott, was that she really missed her father and she was never seeing him. So... I think you could, if you were being totally honest and you said, John, can you just say a little bit more about how close you and John Bonet were and, you know, what is, what is really going on? Can you say anything negative about the closeness? Then I think you would have to concede that they weren't as close as they could have been because she was so busy with her pageants and that he was so busy with his work. And so that, I think, is something that is not entirely accurate about what he's saying here. And I think he was saying this, that, that they're close to sort of mitigate or to as a defense around this allegation that that he was somehow a um, negligent or he was doing something to John Bonet that it was inappropriate kind of thing. And I, I don't think that was the case. So thus far in the interview, and we've only just dealt with the first 44 seconds, has anyone been left out of the Ramsey story, do you think? So you've heard John saying that he wasn't involved. You've heard Patsy say that she wasn't involved. Has anyone been left out? Mrs. Ramsey, what do you want to say to the killer of your daughter? We'll find you. We will find you. I have that as a sole mission for the rest of my life. Mrs. Ramsey? Likewise, the uh, police and investigators have assured us that this is a case which can be solved. You know, you may be eluding the authorities for a time, but God knows who you are and we will find you. I don't think you need to be a true crime expert, a body language expert, a voice analysis expert or anything like that. I don't think you need to be a rocket scientist to see how when the reporter is sitting kind of right opposite John sort of leans forward and says, you know, what do you want to say to the person who did this? You know, she's kind of reminding them that isn't that what this is about? Isn't that isn't what this is about? Not just we are innocent, which is what they both trying to convince the media. So in other words, th their first statements are 
I didn't do it. And the other one is I didn't do it. And th but then it sort of stops and the media have kind of got to step in and say, well, don't you have a message for the perpetrator? Right. And so, in other words, the media are kind of reminding them, oh, that's why we are here. This is what we're supposed to do. And it's kind of a repeat of what happened on CNN is weren't you going on, you know, you're going on CNN to clear your names. But if you weren't involved, don't you want the public's help to go after the person who was involved? And that part is the part that they, they don't really emphasize, because what are you supposed to say? What evidence was there of this intruder? So John's response to the question, Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey, what do you want to say to the killer of your daughter is, we'll find you. It's 24 years later, have they? Is there any kind of ongoing investigation from John? Is he sort of on a daily basis going to the police station? Is he on a daily basis working on the case? What is he doing? And Patsy says the same thing. We're going to find you. Now, the body language here is quite interesting, is how when they say, we'll find, find you, they shake their heads. So John says, I have that as the sole mission for the rest of my life. And then he sort of licks his lips and looks back to um, the interviewer. Now, what is interesting, when John gave the interview to on Dr. Phil on the 20th anniversary, he sort of said, this is the last time I'm ever speaking to the media. And of course it wasn't. But you would wonder that if there was an intruder out there, wouldn't you want to be talking to the media constantly? Almost like the McCanns did for a while as they were sort of looking for the perpetrator. You know, we need bumper to bumper press coverage. And what happened on the anniversary of John Bernays' death, so this year, was there any statement whatsoever from the Ramses? Not to my knowledge. Do, do you guys know anything about that? So what has happened to this thing is I will search for her killer for the rest of my life. Patsy's body language is a lot more telling is she responds or she kind of takes the cue from John saying likewise. It's not a very strong statement to say likewise. Well, what are you going to do in terms of finding the killer of your daughter? I'm going to do likewise. It's not a very strong statement. It's kind of just, yeah, I'm going to do the same as John. But the important thing is to notice there is as she takes the cue, Patsy shakes her head. Something else that is interesting with Patsy is sometimes when she talks, she will do like a slow blink, almost shutting off the almost the sensory overload of these people asking these questions. And that's something we noticed also when Chris Watts spoke to the media they would be talking to him and he would be saying something, but sort of giving like a slow blink. Just something else to bring up in terms of this interview is what you don't see. So you don't see all of the reporters. You sort of just see the, the Ramses and occasionally one reporter, but obviously it's a room full of reporters. This is a press conference that's been arranged for them. So try to imagine you are actually sitting in the Ramsey's chair. You either sitting on their laps or you're sitting between them or you are one of the Ramsey's. What are you seeing from that perspective? And we're going to be dealing with that in the Patreon segment. We're going to be dealing with who the reporters were, how they came to be there and who else was in the room. Um, I can tell you now that there were a lot of lawyers in the room as well, the Ramsey's lawyers. And that is a subject that comes up in the very next uh, statement made by John Ramsey. I'm going to go out with that. I'm going to play that. And then that is going to be the end of the YouTube segment. If you want to catch the rest of this episode, head on to Patreon. It's, it's patreon.com slash TCRS. And it's on the $2 tier. You can subscribe for a year for I think it's $21. So it's $24 minus a, I think, 5% discount. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you guys tomorrow for episode 25 in the ongoing series, that episode dealing with the 
FBI profile set up by John Douglas. Thank you for listening. I think one of the issues that uh, was distressing to us and it, it perhaps caused some bias uh, of opinion is why did we bring lawyers